just going over um, the period of which I spent part of my aviation life um, in accident investigations, the total number of accidents I actually did attend to in the 40 years I was doing it was about 1,600, give or take, of which probably about, probably half of them didn't um, go back to the sky at all. So yes, there are a lot of, a lot of stories. Um, I've decided to make it a little bit sort of general and not get into the detail of accidents um, and why they happened and how we discovered things. It's, um, <coughs> it's probably a little bit too boring for a lot of people to uh, keep an interest and I thought what I'd do is break it up in no particular um, way but there'll be a bit of humour and a bit of story to tell and a bit of a reminder to pilots as um, many people here today probably still actively flying and uh, I guess if nothing else it just reinforces what you've already learnt somewhere back in your early days. The story starts off at, at uh, Exmouth. It starts off with an aircraft well known to most people which is a Cessna 337. There's not a lot to tell about the story because he didn't have a very long period of ownership on this particular aircraft which was a beautiful 337 um, before he uh, landed with the wheels up and that's being pushed back from the resting place um, after we got it on its wheels the, you can see the propellers bent but there was a lot more damage that doesn't show up there that actually wrote the aeroplane off twisted fuselage and so on so he uh, rang me up I knew him quite well and he rang me up and he said I'm gonna have to get another aircraft and I said well what are you gonna get this time he said oh, I'll get another 337 no, I said okay and uh, he actually paid an engineer that still works on this airport to go to Melbourne and look at one but uh, somewhere in the middle of it all he changed his mind and bought one he'd already been negotiating and uh, as a precaution he flew uh, flew um, over to the um, pickup point in I think it was Albury uh, with um, a very experienced 337 pilot and he decided that he'd get him to manage some of the um, landings on the way back. Everything went very well until they arrived at Exmouth and uh, unfortunately the wheels didn't come down. <laughs> Not because there's any problem, it's just that someone forgot to put them down. So, so uh, yeah, I guess you haven't got to talk much about the lesson we learnt there other than the fact that, that there were two pilots involved in both of them failed to um, carry out a very basic uh, procedure, pre-landing. For those who have never been there or don't know this place, it's in the heart of the Northern Territory and it's a place well known in aviation circles, um, Victoria River Downs. It's uh, just a beautiful place, it's um, an eye opener. And um, in this particular vacation that I was working in, I did see a lot of both WA and, and um, the Northern Territory which were the two areas that I covered. This is the main homestead and all the workshops is they had their own um, um, museum and they had um, a helicopter farm, there was um, a variety of fixed wing and John Waymouth who, who um, was a proud owner had quite a, a collection of aeroplanes. Anyway, the reason I was going up there was that uh, and the Robinson R22 had uh, come to grief. So uh, that, in those days, that was part of part of my job to go and have a look and see whether it was repairable or whether it wasn't, and also to find out why it, cr it crashed. That's the aeroplane, um, minus the tail rotor. So. Uh, I think from memory it was mass bumping and it doesn't take much to uh, stop the aeroplane flying normally. During the time that I was there, which was a fairly full day, it was pretty hot as you can imagine, I um, prepared myself, put my toolbox up on the uh, tray of the truck 
and uh, spent about an hour looking around uh, the um, aircraft, taking notes and photographing photographing items that were of interest. Anyway, it was lunchtime and uh, the boys in the engine shop said, why don't you come and have lunch with us, which I, I did. And at the end of lunch, I um, sauntered back to the um, helicopter and um, I found that quite a number of my tools that I had on the lid of the toolbox on the back of the uh, truck tray were missing. And so I searched around everywhere and I thought, well, I know I left them there. And um, as, uh, as time went on, I thought, I'd better go back to the guys and alert them to what I think is something strange. And uh, we, when I uh, got back there, I had a chat with them and said, look, there's a whole heap of my tools gone missing. I can't understand it. And I saw one lad look to the other and he said, Henry. <laughs> he had quite a collection, actually. <laughs> and he was well known for, uh, for pinching tools. This is um, now a company that doesn't operate in WA anymore. But um, you'll see by the, uh, the damage to this rear fuselage of a grob that someone got awfully close with the, their own propeller. It turned out to be quite a, a devastating accident. The uh, engines disconnected, as you can see, from the fuselage. And there's a bit more of the aeroplane <laughs> spread around. And the one that struck him is further down the runway. And um, as it turned out, the pilot in this one was trapped and the aircraft was on fire. And um, fortunately for him, there was a number of um, <coughs> uh, people that worked with, I think the people that managed the maintenance on um, airports, uh, installing some lighting, taxi lighting and they heard the accident, looked up, ran over and uh, helped the, um, the pilot out. He, um, he suffered from a bruised thumbnail, so um, Lady Luck smiled on him. Heading back up into the Northern Territory, just one of the many stations called Riveren, R-I-V-E-R-E-N. This, this gentleman that had this property, had a, his p parents owned one on the WA site, called Nicholson, which is well known. Anyway, we, um, I was flying, flying in there a particular day, and we expected um, an overnight stay, but uh, as it turned out, about 10 o'clock, we were woken by um, lightning and thunder, and when I looked out, I could see lightning vertically coming into the ground and setting fire to the ground. The, the fallout of that storm was that it was a huge rainfall and for those who know the Northern Territory well the soil that comprises the runways turns into something like the equivalent of sticky chocolate. The following morning when we got up for breakfast the uh, owner said uh, I don't think you fellas are going anywhere today and uh, we thought no that's, that's pretty obvious so after breakfast he said um, what do you guys fancy doing and we said oh I know, I just had to hang around. He said, well, why don't you come with me and the young fella? We're going shopping. And I thought, shopping? We sort of let it go a bit, and eventually he said, yeah, we, we've got to get some meat. So as it turned out, off we went. But I thought I'd just show you these two photos because if ever you contemplate driving into uh, riverbeds with water flowing, be aware that they're not all nice sandy bottoms. There's some pretty nasty surprises there. So anyway, off we go, and after about an hour's drive um, over some pretty horrid terrain, we started following cattle around this particular yard, and eventually we picked on that white one you can see running in the back there. The owner said, I'll give you a lesson in butchering, and it was, it was unbelievable, but we saw every part of a, um, a, an animal that you normally go into a butcher's and see which has got its own names, the various parts. 
we uh, we covered the tray of the ute with fresh gum leaves and that, that's how we took it back. When I was when we were driving back I was curious and I said to him that animal seemed to know that you had him marked out. He said oh he did and I said why did you select that one and he said it was the neighbours. <laughs> so, <laughs> to, which, to which I said but what does the neighbour do to you? He said same thing. Bit of fun. A, a year later I went back to his own accident in his 182. He had um, gone out doing a mill run and he came to a yard where he had a holding yard where there was quite a lot of cattle and it was important that that windmill was pumping water into the troughs. So he was doing a circuit obviously too low because if you can see the wing tip it's bent up and he finished up cartwheeling. The um, aircraft finished up upside down actually. This is when it's been righted. He survived and when when I actually saw him, I went and saw him in Darwin Hospital, I said to him, how long was it, do you know, between when you had the accident and when you came to? Because what we'd found out from his wife was that he'd been strapped in correctly and properly and after the impact and the aircraft flipping over, he remained unconscious for approximately um, seven or eight hours, which was a long time, upside down. Anyway, he said, when, when I came to, um, he said, I couldn't work out why the rudder was down the front of the windscreen. And of course, once he saw the aeroplane, he did realise he'd rolled it up. As it turned out, um, John survived a few more serious accidents, but mostly being gored by a bull and various other accidents. But uh, that was his first and last aeroplane accident. Made a mess of the old girl. Three Rivers Station up in uh, the Gascoigne. I went to have a look at a 150 that had been seriously damaged. I was sitting on the um, veranda with the station people having a cup of tea and we got talking about it and I said what actually happened and they said well we were just sitting here like we are now having some lunch and he said this almighty noise started and he said we looked at each other and thought that's a diesel locomotive and then somebody said well it can't be because we haven't got a rail line here and then they thought well maybe it's a 747 so well this runway's not long enough for that so it turned out it was a hell of a storm coming through, cyclonic. And as it turned out, about six months earlier, the engineer that regularly visited this station to do maintenance on the 150 said to them one day, why don't you guys buy a hangar for the aeroplane instead of leaving it outside all the time? Later on, they rang him and said, are you coming up for service? And they, he said, yeah. So well. We've got some good news for you. We we bought next door's old hangar and transported it over here and put it in the ground. But unfortunately, the cyclone that they heard was real and it lifted the whole hangar out of the ground, concrete blocks and all, and dropped it back on the 150. So after 15 years of being out in the, the elements, unscathed, on a bit of advice from an engineer, it went horribly wrong. That's the poor old girl. Actually, I was looking through some old footage um, recently and I saw R ROZ way back in its Melbourne days. So it's sort of been around a bit. This is um, a bit of a story about what you shouldn't do. And it was uh, Coolin Island off the, uh, the coast of WA. And the, the aircraft associated was um, a Lake Buccaneer, not well known to a lot of people, but probably a lot of aviation people would clearly remember the Lake Buccaneer. There was one around Janicott at one stage. Anyway, the story went along the lines that the guy that was a salesman had rung his wife up just a few days before Christmas and said, I've got a prospective buyer up north. 
he said somewhere in, in Queensland, but it wasn't true. Prospective buyer didn't exist, but a blonde did. And um, so he took this journey up to um, Kulin Island, and before he left, he spoke to the harbour master and said, whereabouts can I put the aeroplane? And um, they said, well, there's two or three little beaches you can put it on, or you can anchor in the lee of one of the islands. <coughs> so they left it to him. That's the motel on the right-hand side there. That's some of the archipelago. That's mine site. Um, and it turned out that when I'm sort of recounting the situation with the harbour master, he said, well, we offered him two or three options in sheltered water. We gave him an option he could beach it. And for some reason, he's come round to the harbour, which is the deepest part of the waterways, and hung off one of the boys for the ore carriers. So it turned out that uh, they rang the motel and said, is the pilot still around somewhere? And they said, well, he's supposed to have gone, and they didn't know where he was, but if they could find him, they'd tell him that the aeroplane had gone missing. Eventually the guy turned up and asked the harbour master if he could have the loan of a dinghy to go out to the aeroplane. He wanted to retrieve some stuff. The harbour master had already advised him it was hanging off the chain below the surface. So with that they sat with binoculars and watched him for the best part of the day and they did say to him, if you're not an experienced uh, underwater diver, we advise that you don't do it and we've got guys here that actually have a club and they're very experienced. No, no, I'll do it myself. So about halfway through the day they had a conversation with him um, when he came in for a break and um, he still insisted he was going to go back and get what he wanted from the aircraft but he was having difficulty finding it. So apparently there were two things that he was after. One was a very, very exotic uh, shotgun and the other one was numerous white bags containing who knows. Um, so with that I spoke to him before I left Perth and he said I'll see you at Broome. Um, he never turned up and I'm assuming that uh, he went back and um, somehow sorted out stuff with his wife because uh, um, he promised me back for a party, Christmas party. So I think he might have escaped the inevitable, but I'll never know. Talking to the harbour master when I was up there, he said he was luckier than uh, he, he knows. And I said, how's that? He said there was a crocodile sitting on a ledge above the waterline and sat there for two and a half days watching him. And I said, lucky? He said, yeah. He said, they don't seem to hang around much more than three days before they take off. So that guy will never know. But uh, interesting. We move on to Port Hedland and there's a, like, a, like, a Shrike Commander 500 involved in this short story and the, um, the pilot was a guy well known at that stage and had been operating in the Pilbara and he was doing a um, charter flight taking um, foodstuffs to a community somewhere east. During the takeoff he had lost an engine and the aircraft started to sink and he thought well I better get rid of as much drag as I can and he feathered the wrong engine. So I finished up in the harbour and uh, caused a bit of um, consternation with movement of uh, oil carriers and that but eventually they got a um, crane and lifted it out and uh, so I went to um, <coughs> meet the uh, pilot, have a talk to him and I said um, I believe there was two passengers with you and he said yes. He said there was an Aboriginal lad about, I think from memory, about 17 
and um, a small child, about one years of age. It turns out, when it ditched, I said to him, how did you manage your passengers? And he said, well, he said it was a bit odd, but he said, I, um, I got him out of the, the, the seat and in, into the water, and um, he said, I can't swim. And so he said, I thought, well, I've got to sort this out properly. So he said, I grabbed the baby and shoved it in his arms and said, there you will. <laughs> and he said, he did, he swam. So um, he then got out and they managed to get ashore. I can tell you when, and I was about a week after before I got up there, when an aeroplane's full of processed meats and other vegetables and stuff, it smells. Well, there's a, there's a, I'm only going to tell you the good luck side of it and the humorous side of the story because um, I have spoken about this one on a previous talk where, whereby it was all to do with a fuel vent problem. But in this particular case, the pilot um, was well known around Janicott and um, he was a uh, flying instructor as well. But at this particular time, he was full time with the Dunn family. It ran out of uh, power um, in a pre preparation circuit for dropping the water. Descent became obvious to the pilot that he wasn't going to recover from it. And so um, he hit the house. That's probably the bad luck side of it for the owner. But the good luck was if you look down between his legs behind the control column there's a bit of four by three missed him completely and there's a piece of roof timber that went through the windscreen and missed his eye by centimeters so yes it was a, a lucky day for the pilot before it ran into the roof of that house and this is over at Maddington over here before it ran into the roof of that house it just brushed the roof prior to the impact house and there's a number of tiles been removed and uh, a, a covering put over it since it happened. When I went to uh, interview the people that lived in this house because obviously there'd be insurance claims covering that house as well, the people were um, quite chatty, heard the aircraft flying low and went out the front door to have a look at it, didn't actually see the impact. I said well I'm, if I can find someone that's seen any part of the impact that would be appreciated. So, well, actually, our daughter thought she saw it. I said, but where was your daughter? And she was in the bedroom below that laundry pot. So I said, can I talk to her? She said, yeah. So she was about 18. I got chatting to her and I said, I got a bit of detail about her. So it provides what the insurance company wants to know. And I, I did say to her, I said, are you working? She said, oh, I used to. I was a pole dancer. So I said, OK. Anyway, from there, I said, tell me what happened. She said, well, I was lying on my bed and I heard the aeroplane come, but she said, all of a sudden, she said, my car went over the roof. And I said, your car? She said, yeah. And I couldn't work it out. And I said, how do you know it was your car? She said, it was bright yellow. With that, yeah, I thought, well, that's humorous, if anything, for even her to think that's my car. But as it turned out, she'd only just had it re-sprayed a week or so earlier, and uh, this, um, this was what triggered her, her thoughts. Going around to a more sombre uh, investigation I carried out was a place called Mount Many Peaks in um, east of Albany. And it's a very rugged coastline. All the information I had was that there was a um, Cessna 337 had crashed almost down on the um, foreshore. It had three people plus the pilot on board, all perished. The pilot himself was a highly experienced 337 pilot who did a full-time job as a whale spotter. The short end of the story was that a girl from one of the bureaus in, in um, Albany took time off to go for a hike along the coastline and she came across what looked like 
serious plastic drums of something, but they were sealed. Unfortunately, when they drove out, the police drove out to have a look at this report, they couldn't get down to that site. It's just on 1,100 feet to the top of the, the hill. So with that, they went back to the airport and asked John Bell, who was then the pilot for the 337, if he could fly them out there to get lower to have a look at it. And um, in his endeavours to get down very low, um, things went wrong and the aircraft stalled and they perished. Just to give you some idea of some of the things you do in your job, finding aeroplanes can be very difficult. Along the shoreline, about the centre of it, there's a silvery looking object back just on the green and it's uh, the aircraft. And that's from about 1,200 12, odd feet. Sometimes finding aeroplanes can be a challenge for anyone. Another shot with the aeroplane down on the rock line. Another shot where it's difficult to see, back onto the aircraft mid, mid along that coastline there. And you can see it much clearer there. The only way we could get in was to be hooked in on um, the police helicopter. Yeah, what appeared to be sand from 1,200 feet was big boulders and rocks. That was actually the terrain we're walking up to uh, towards the aircraft. So, um, yeah, some challenges along the way. And if all else fails, I've never actually come across anyone that says it works. The panic button. Um, this is an example of if you're going to steal a Cessna 210, make sure you take the gust lock out. Unfortunately, the young boy that uh, stole this aeroplane in Kalgoorlie paid the price. I did hear from the police during a conversation that he had been seen round town drinking a fair amount of vodka and orange, so I think he must have built up a bit of intestinal fortitude to have a crack at flying. But yeah, didn't get the gust lock out because he didn't know it existed. Oh, and if, yeah, if you're going to steal an Eagle aircraft, make sure that you know the dimensions between the two hangars. <laughs> <laughs> this one didn't fit. Um, just another bit of humour in an unfortunate accident. This was at Le Gendre Island, off Onslow. The um, pilot that flew me out there in the Jet Ranger um, was very talkative. So much so that, you know, you wanted to switch him off, but he wouldn't stop. And it was all about what a stupid pilot this guy was and if he was flying, what he would have done. The actual pilot of this helicopter had, I think, uh, close to 14,000 hours, of which 8,000 was in the Antarctic. So one would have to say that he had a bit of experience. But what actually happened, and it's all to do with trust, he was doing ship to uh, shore. There was a small um, campsite on the island with two guys that were doing some monitoring of what I don't know actually. But um, he would uh, fly out to them um, at intervals of a few days at the part and deliver them fresh food and various other stuff from the boat and then he would fly back to the boat with whatever information he picked up. The guys in, on the ground gave him the thumbs up to fly back to the ship and um, as he did, he got airborne and and he got up to about 200 feet and he could hear a thumping noise. And he looked down and, uh, into his mirrors and he could see that uh, the cargo he was carrying in the cargo net was striking the um, rear of the helicopter and he knew that if it did it once more it might be the end of him. It did it once more before he could do anything about it and took him down. And what it turned out was that the, the guys on the shore had gave him the thumbs up after they'd closed the lid on the box in the big um, webbed uh, net. But they didn't put the Hasman crisp on properly. And it came open and became a box kite. So once it took the tail rotor, it um, finished. The guy that flew me out there, um, then on the way back was so full of what he would and would have done and how he would have done and so on. Three months later, on a call back to Exmouth, to, uh, to Karatha, he himself had had an accident and strangely almost identical in terms of what happened was that 
he came back from um, um, Barrow Island and when he came into the apron at the um, hangar at Caratha, the engineer that was giving him the thumbs up um, to lower the, um, the um, netting, at that point when he gives him the thumbs up that's a signal to release the hook and then he gets another thumbs up to fly away from it. Um, he released the hook but before he got the second thumbs up he started to move off. It hadn't released the load so the um, forces applied to the lifting point on the helicopter caused it to gyro over on its side. I said to uh, the engineer when I was up there, I said where were you when this all happened? He said, he said I was out in the open, he said but I ran and stood behind the fuel bowser. <laughs> So I said, yeah, really, but uh, there wasn't much choice, it was either that or nothing. Anyway, um, I said to him, is the pilot still around? He said, no, he said he's been sacked. And it turns out he had a job as a doorman on the Allendale Square in um, St George's Terrace. So some pilots don't graduate. Someone that we all knew, probably, or most people knew way back when the early uh, 210s, around the 19. Uh, 70 onward models uh, became popular and this particular one went on a business trip up to a station in the uh, Gascoigne, ripped off a tail during takeoff and that's the takeoff looking back at the takeoff run which isn't the runway but actually a taxiway as, as I understand it they got in at last light and taxied in from another direction the pilot apparently got instructions or guidance from someone local on the station which he misread and thought when he went out and got in the aeroplane still a bit, a bit dark that um, it wasn't the runway but the uh, taxiway. One of the few sad stories that uh, the moral of the story probably is that if someone that's got experience and you listen to take notice of what they say uh, particularly, um, you know, under certain circumstances, it can be um, the difference between surviving and not. This one, unfortunately, the pilot was a, um, a padre, did regular runs out to um, Lake King uh, to hold a service, and uh, on um, on this flight, he, they also took, uh, apart from his wife, they took um, a friend and uh, his wife, and. All we know is that the aeroplane taxied out after the service. Um, the local guy there that actually had had a part in keeping the airport in good condition, and general maintenance sort of guy, he um, said to the uh, Padre, he said, why are you going back tonight? He said, you, uh, you've got a beautiful day forecast tomorrow. And he said, well, no, he said, I've... Uh, I've got my night VMC and he said I need to put some time in practicing. Unfortunately, as this often happens in circumstances, when they started up on the concrete um, bitumen, sorry, the bitumen surface, um, he had a mag drop. So he came back to um, the terminal, spoke to the guy there and said, um, look, why don't you take it down to the other end of the runway where there's some hard stand and do your run up and check the magnetos and if it's if it's okay, well you're right to go. If it's not, well we better have a look at it. So he, his recount of the story was that the aircraft taxied down to the eastern end of the runway and uh, he heard him do a few uh, burnout runs to clear the, the um, plugs and then he witnessed the aeroplane take off. Unfortunately, the takeoff direction was over the top of Lake Kingtown, so it wasn't visible to the pilot. The, um, again, the uh, person telling me the story said the aircraft seemed to be just doing a, a high-powered climb and dive, followed by a dive into the ground or into the lake. The four on board perished, of course. It turned out, when I spoke to uh, Harry Smolens, who was the instructor at the time of the CFI at the time of the um, aero um, training school. 
he had tried to talk this guy out of even doing his night VMC rating and was disappointed that this was the outcome. There was a time when the growth of flying training schools prompted unusual measures in getting customers and I think this guy was convinced that he could get his night VMC one way or the other and he did get it and it just proved that um, he wasn't ready for it. As Harry had told him, you are not ready for a night VMC. So, yeah, when someone gets good advice and doesn't take it, well, there's not much more you can do. And it makes, I guess it makes your blood boil a bit when um, you've gone to the trouble of refusing to give him a, an endorsement um, and they still go and get one. This is just a um, another story about being aware of yourself and your limitations. Um, it was the Beechcraft Baron, but um, not, not a lot of it remained. And uh, it turned out that uh, this pilot, who was very experienced, went up to uh, Halls Creek, uh, did a crew change on a mining site, but um, overnighted, of course, and prepared for a 3 4.30, 4.30 takeoff. He had a lot of trouble getting um, the passengers organised because they'd been on the, on the wobbler all uh, evening and uh, he fin finally got them all assembled and sorted out the aircraft and took off. It's what I think commonly referred to as a black hole takeoff where you end up pushing the aeroplane back into the ground rather than lifting it up and climbing. To do with acceleration and vestibulars and final effect is that you're putting pressure on the control column put the nose down because you think it's climbing too high but it's not there's more to that story but yeah the end of that, that story was that the pilot himself I think had pushed the envelope unfortunately um, where um, the um, the day was long and once he got to Horse Creek he took an invitation and offer to go out the mine site came back had a couple of drinks he did go to bed reasonably early, but he, you know, he couldn't sleep. So, yeah, at the end of the day, um, things go wrong. And it's part of the reason why you are taught to, uh, to have your faculties in order and uh, preferably not take any baggage with you when you um, go flying. There's enough to do. Add in the back blocks of Kununurra, the Cessna 206, I say was. And it's just a story where the um, maintenance company bowed to the pressure of the, the owner of the aircraft to let him do his own general maintenance. And um, all it turned out to be was a little little fur ball of hair that had accumulated in the, the um, fuel injection system and um, it was enough to stop the aeroplane. Don't do things and get involved in areas where you know experts are required Another one which just for general advice I guess is that people put their aircraft in for maintenance and in a lot of cases there's a lot of mud and stuff around the undercarriage system and the wheels. And you can see the de degree of corrosion that's in the hub of that wheel. This was a um, Bonanza doing a gas pipe run uh, out of Geraldton and that's clean, but it wasn't clean when I got it. It was absolutely caked in mud. So it's very hard for someone to do an inspection effectively if, um, if it's not clean. And I know the pressure was always on to, uh, to get the job done quickly so they could have the aeroplane back the same day, which quite often meant if you spent time cleaning the aeroplane, you haven't got time to do all your maintenance. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but yeah, that's the result. The other half of the wheel was broken up, there was nothing left of it. And that was uh, oh, Halls Creek. Um, there were five aeroplanes parked on the um, parking apron, all tied down. But this one, and it was a rally manoeuvre, so it was a bit different, but this one was the only aircraft that didn't stay tied down and finished up on its back. The guy had spent a fortune on really good tie-down ropes but then he bought those three shackles from one of those op shops, $2 shops. Another story which really has a bit of a twist to it is the rotor blade, main rotor blade of a Robinson R22. 
and I was about a week behind the Air Transport Bureau of Air Safety investigation because there was two fatal on board and the pilot was actually a, a personal friend of mine. He had gone from fixed wing aircraft to rotary wing. He had both on his fleet, but this particular aeroplane had um, come up for a 2000 alley, which was a routine inspection period, a major inspection period on the Robinson. I walked around the helicopter and was pretty much burned out. There wasn't a lot left, but I noticed this part of the rotor blade that was remaining actually had a, a styration or a, a curvature. And if you look at the bottom, there's a screw mounting in the hub of the um, helicopter blade and it's part of the manufacturing process but when it's drilled they have to use a fairly blunt drill because if you use a pointed tip drill it becomes a stress racer for fatigue. He rang me the day before, two days before, we were chatting about it and he said that he um, had, a, had a job out on the station but um, and he's Rotor blades actually had expired, 2,000 hours. But he, I said to him, well, he can't fly. And he said, no, he said, they're not designed to fall apart just because they reach 2,000 hours. That's just the safety factor. And I said, well, up to you. The blade failed because of fatigue, not because he went over the time. But the whole point of the story then becomes, well, if it had changed it on time. The rotor blades were ordered and they're on their way at the time he spoke to me, he, you know, he was quite confident he wouldn't be doing much more flying before they arrived. That part was true. Seems like I spent a bit of time at Horse Creek. <laughs> and this is an international airport at Horse Creek, air conditioned. And that's the restaurant in Horse Creek, which is a pretty flash building. As I drove along the, the main drag, I came across a couple of elders and um, stopped to see if they could give them a lift and they thanked me very much but they said no they'll get the, they'll pick up the bus when it comes through in a few minutes when I went past it I sort of should have gone back and said well it's full <laughs> uh, not interesting that's just an aerial shot and I, I really just had in a mixture of interesting photos that's our gold diamond mine which is now been and gone and um, yeah interesting place just uh, south of Kununurra. And that was just a spectacular shot of 188 that uh, come to grief out in the canola crop. And um, while I was out on a station, well not a station, an accident site north of Maluna, the um, Bureau of Air Safety guys went up to the camp and um, left me on my own. And that's another story for another time. When they came and got me, uh, we wrapped up everything and went back to the camp to um, have some refreshments. They'd prepared a meal for us to eat on the way back in the aeroplane. And um, they said to me, if you want to clean your teeth, choose your toothbrush. There was a piece of a tree, tree uh, branch that um, had about eight or 10 toothbrushes. And that was their laundry and, and um, washroom. So another one south of Halls Creek um, was in Robinson. And the pilot stopped to make some notes in a little spiral X um, notebook and um, didn't put the collective pitch lock on and uh, they're, they're, when you're sitting in them um, with the rotors just at idle there it's not a not a comfortable sit it's there's a lot of jiggling around in this instance the uh, helicopter being um, in an unlocked situation on the collective um, started to drift back into a pitch angle which gave lift. That lift translated into um, uncontrollable flight. You can see the tree in the foreground lost all of its trunks and wrecked the helicopter. Um, just to the right of that accident was an interesting little spot with, with a, um, hot springs. And uh, the owners told me that uh, um, well over 100 years it had never been dry. So there's been some pretty dry years up there, but that always remained full. People often ask me how I managed to um, get aeroplanes back on their feet in the, in the bush. Well, when you've got a toolbox like this, it's not hard. 
and you, you sort of approach the guy and say, have you got something I can lift the aeroplane with? And he says, yeah, and he comes back, he says, will this do? And then he's concerned that it mightn't lift the weight. The, sometimes, you know, perception is, uh, is um, confused with um, reality. That was another one we lifted with another piece of um, handy equipment. And that was one that two pilots flew up to um, Calberry from Geraldton, didn't read the NOTAMs and landed on what was once an airstrip but was no longer. I used to, I used to get asked why am I lifting it by the tail. It wasn't, it wasn't the preferred option, it was pretty much the only option if I needed to get them either away from where they were or on their, on their feet or to continue the investigation. If you lifted an aeroplane by the tail tie down ring, it's a good chance it'll just break off. But in fact, by just picking it up, slowly angling it, but leaving the weight on the spinner, propeller spinner, you can manage to get most of them over without doing any more damage. I got asked, asked a, a guy, a pilot one day, to get, give me instructions as to uh, to where the aeroplane was that I was going to look at that he had flown. He said, oh, I've just left it parked up against a tree down the end of the track. I didn't go back and say, you're a lousy parker. That was just a little uh, indication of the forces implied to propellers when they're retained in a hub. It's a constant speed prop. Going back a bit to the earlier days, but and they were problematic. But um, the propeller from that one took off, well, the aircraft took off from Kananara. It took us, I think, seven years to find the blade that left that um, cracked hub. And something like um, 60,000 kilos of force, I believe. Another one that's a bit close to home, but just an indication of the margin between serious and non-serious. The aircraft uh, was doing a, um, a practice flight over a property and uh, the approach and landing went wrong. Um, the pilot has become a paraplegic for the rest of his life. The chap in the back seat stepped out and flies biz jets and other aircraft this day. So there's only a couple of feet between the two, but the difference is enormous. A lot of people look at accidents and often wonder what happens. It's hard to say because until you know how the aeroplane had the accident, it's not possible to understand the rest of uh, the outcome. Back to Mr. Dunn's family, and um, this was a power loss whilst um, preparing to do some water bombing. When he saw the, the terrain in front of him, which was virtually going to be um, a very sudden stoppage in a ditch, he elevated the aircraft over it and landed, and then he ground looped it, or partly, and um, in so doing, he managed to hit the trees in such a way that it separated the wing from the front spar to the rear spar. Very clean. And heading up to um, Northern Territory, this is the Stewart Highway, and it's a little town called uh, Elliot. Elliot. Not much to see, not much to do, and it's just a, a road that gets boringly long. But there was a group of aircraft hired from Janicott, an operator of Janicott, and one of the uh, aircraft joined about three out of about seven that started for the second leg of the journey, which included Northern Territory. And this aircraft actually got down and flew along the highway and three people died. What they struck was um, a little feeder line that runs from the main line on the side of the highway once every 100 kilometres and they struck it. At the time, the person leading the, um, you know, a group from Germany, the group that was doing this fly, said, well, I'm, I'm absolutely flummoxed. He said, oh, I don't believe that this pilot would fly that low. But when we recovered the camera from the aeroplane, there was low flying up the coast of Carnarvon and elsewhere. Once every 100 kilometres, there's a, a line that crosses over the highway. 
it's a story that I won't go into the full detail, but it again it reinforces the the need to make sure that you're not pushing the boundaries when you go flying. It's very hard to stand here and give advice because we all succumb to pressure, we all succumb to obligations and various other reasons why you have to go, why you must do it. But this flight should never have happened and it did through a whole series of events that were partly commercial with his own trucking company, problems with the fuel people that supplied um, fuel at uh, Genicott, meetings in the city with people about his insolvency and so it went on until finally he pushed the boundaries and he and his passenger paid, paid the price. Probably for the untrained eye it's not easy to see but the damage to the wings on this aircraft when he was forced to do a go around after an unsuccessful landing in less than ideal conditions. The pilot, um, we believe, from what we've deduced from the incident, thought he was running out of fuel. In actual fact, the telltale signs of the damage to the wing says no, he, he wasn't. And when we got to the crash site, there was still, I think, 30 or 40 litres that hadn't leaked out of the aeroplane. All in all, there was something like 90 litres still available to him, but the way it happened, um, the aircraft was not selected on the, the right tanks at the right, wrong, right time, and nosedived back into the ground. Yeah, very sad. I think this one's in closing, but it's, it's one in which um, I think the moral of the story is don't do it. And if you're going to do it, don't push the limits and boundaries. But, you know, out of sight, it's, uh, it's a temptation to do stuff like that. And this was the pilot's, I think, sister's property. And um, you can see right in the background, there's a tree lying on the ground next to the parts of the aeroplane. The instrument panel on the engine is well down the front. That's the tree he took out. It's an RV-6, which is a very popular aeroplane. And there's the bits and pieces spread around the place. And that's the end of the story. Part of... <laughs> ...with the election. <laughs>